Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, glad to see so many people here uh, coming uh, who want to meet and share and learn from uh, Steve Denning that we have tonight, which is really an honor for us. Uh, <coughs> so tonight we are at uh, CRISP, uh, Agile Consultancy here in Stockholm. I'm really, really happy to uh, be able to host uh, Steve here. And uh, it's a meetup event organized by Agile People. So that's the uh, network that we have to um, kind of uh, accelerate the change of uh, creating better organizations, more agile organizations. And uh, how many of you have been uh, part of a meetup before here at Agile People? Okay, about two thirds, that's great. And how many of you have been at CRISP before? Uh, the same people, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Steve has just released his new book, Age of Agile. So we're really excited to hear about um, his research behind the book and what he has learned and uh, what's it b about. And uh, it's a really good book. I've just uh, read it. So um, I'm really excited to hear more about it. Um, we will have uh, Matthias uh, Holmgren here from CRISP and Nadia People um, moderating a bit together with Pia Mia Torian, also with Nadia People. So um, welcome the three of you and uh, let's get started. You have your own. I don't know, do we, do we need this? Do we need it? Yes. Do we need mm -hmm. it for the recording? Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Matthias, then we have to, you have to come and s s stand here with me. <laughs> okay, we are going to do this a bit informal. We didn't prepare anything. We said <laughs> it'll be more nice if we don't do a formal presentation, but we do a kind of a question and answer session where we maybe start off to ask some questions, me and Matthias, and then you will continue. So we kind of have a talk about the age of Agile and about your book and uh, what you have been doing and uh, what you have felt, because you're traveling a lot, as I understand it. Is that correct? I met you in India, right? Yeah, <laughs> we met in India. So <laughs> we were there at Agile India. And uh, then we met in New York. And in again. New York, <laughs> again in New York, right? Yeah. Uh, so you, where were you in Australia? I didn't see you there. <laughs> no, I'm going next year. Yeah, <laughs> next time. Uh, yeah, I'm traveling. Yeah. 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 What, what, um, what is the main? What are the main uh, questions that you get on your travels, and uh, uh, what do they ask you people the most? Why did you write this book? <laughs> and, um, and maybe I could just start with a little bit about my, uh, the story of why I wrote the book and, um, and what I'm doing now and where things are leading. And um, uh, begin at the beginning, I was born in Sydney, Australia, and I grew up there. I go right back whenever I need to, uh, <laughs> though I was there two weeks ago and they told me my accent is really out of date. People don't talk, talk like that anymore. <laughs> but I did hear some people talking like that, so <laughs> it's not fashionable to talk like that. I, um, I s worked as a lawyer in Sydney. I worked, um, got a law degree. I then went to Oxford University in England, studied some more law, and then I joined the World Bank. And a um, big international organization lends billions of dollars and uh, the goal of eliminating world poverty and uh, I worked there for several decades. And uh, in fact, uh, I was a, still am a very left brain analytic kind of person. So as you know, big organizations love that kind of person. So I climbed up the managerial ladder in the World Bank. <laughs> and uh, in due course, I ended up uh, leading a strategic change in the World Bank, big strategic change. and. People were kind of amazed that, how did you do that? How was it possible? This, the World Bank is like the world's most change-resistant organization. How was this possible? More than the UN? <laughs> Sorry? More than the UN? Um, much more, much more. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had to confess that I'd stumbled on the power of leadership storytelling. 
and it was this that had, um, enabled me to spark change. So when I left the World Bank in 2000, I spent the next eight, 10 years wandering around the Fortune 500 companies, teaching them how to tell stories, which was a pretty strange thing for a left brain analytic person to be doing, but that's what I did. And it was quite successful, and we launched big changes in big firms. And uh, but after a time, I saw that these changes didn't <coughs> stick. They didn't stick, that uh, you'd launch the change, and then something would happen. It would always be something different. There'd be a new CEO, or there'd be a budget crunch, or there'd be a takeover, or it was always something. And I thought, well, this is kind of silly. I mean, here are these in firms full of intelligent people doing some pretty unintelligent things. So is there any intelligent life on the planet? <laughs> is, are there any intelligent firms around? So I started asking that. And I, in due course, I stumbled on Agile around 2008. And I thought, well, this, this stuff is amazing. Uh, because uh, you guys have figured out how to solve the central uh, management conundrum that had really stumped the whole the management world for the, in the 20th century. That is how to get continuous innovation with disciplined execution. And Agile had, had found a way to kind of bottle that and replicate it. Up till then, it was kind of something that happened. A lightning would have to strike. It was an accident. But Agile found a way to make that happen in a systematic fashion. So I thought, this stuff is amazing. And uh, so I, I wrote a the 2010 book uh, on radical management about it, and it had two kinds of receptions. One reception was in the agile community, which was, yay! <laughs> Everyone loved it, um, and that was kind of gratifying. But then I'd go to places like the Drucker Forum, which is sort of general management, and they told me, Steve, this is stupid. Uh, <laughs> this stuff will never work. Uh, it might work in so those people in the basement with blue hair and tattoos doing software. Um, it might work in tiny little teams, um, but it's never going to work in big organizations. Big organizations, we know several thousand years of human history, you have to have top down. You have to have control. You have to have command. You have all of the things that are missing in your stupid ideas. Uh, that's what big organizations are always going to be. So go away, don't bother us. This isn't going to work in big organizations. And um, so I said, just you wait. <laughs> um, I think by 2020, this will have taken over the world. That this idea is so powerful, it will, um, it will prevail. And they laughed at me again. And, um, in, in the next couple of years, I thought, well, why don't I get together with firm, big firms that are actually making this happen and doing it? So I helped form a learning consortium of firms around the world, small group of firms, but rather large firms, Microsoft, Ericsson, uh, Barclays, and whatnot, and got a sort of a, a, a forum where they could share, story, share experiences and figured out what works and what doesn't work. Uh, because there's a whole lot of noise going on about Agile, a whole lot of people talking about it. And it's difficult to figure out what's actually going on. So I thought if we actually got <laughs> together in a private space, we could then figure out what is really happening. And so we did that and uh, convinced me that, in fact, yes, it's, this was taking hold. And it did work in big organizations. And there were many problems to be solved. but. Um, it was so much better than what had gone before. It, again, had um, uh, enormous promise. Um, so if you fast forward to um, 2017, 2018, what you see? You see that the, the five biggest firms on the planet by market capitalization happen to be agile. Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, uh, Microsoft. Those are the five biggest firms on the planet right now in market capitalization. So, so now I go back to the Drucker Forum or to McKinsey or in those places and say, look, <laughs> you told me this wasn't going to work in the biggest firm. Here are the five biggest firms in the world. And guess what? They are all agile. So this is 
ahead of schedule instead of 2020, 2018, we can say that Agile is really uh, here in the mainstream. So this was um, uh, a reassurance that we'd been able to um, um, make this progress. But there's still many problems, obviously, that we can talk about all the issues we still have to face. But I mean, there's been tremendous movement, um, uh, not just the biggest firms in the world doing it, but now the Vatican of Management, Harvard Business Review, that has, has three articles on Agile in this current issue. We'll have another article next month. Um, McKinsey has uh, just published a book, it's a, it's a pretty silly book, but it nevertheless <laughs> does, does, say, does say that Agile is uh, really the future, um, among other things, which are less sensible. Um, so this, this really is happening on a, on a large <coughs> scale. Um, it sometimes doesn't have the same name, um, and there are firms that are calling themselves Agile that are not Agile, obviously. Um, they, I cited a Deloitte survey where um, a thousand executives all around the world, and the result was that the, the percentage of firms that want to be agile, 94%. Uh, the firms that are already highly agile, 6%. <laughs> so in, in terms of implementation, uh, there's a huge gap, but this is where people can now see this is what is needed, in a sense, to succeed, to flourish in the world. The old way of running organizations doesn't fit anymore, and there's a different performance requirement, and there's a different way to deliver on that requirement. I'm also at, uh, currently sort of working on a film with my producer of the film, Araceli de Leon, and I'm going to ask her to just say a word about what our documentary film on Agile to help spread the word about uh, how this amazing thing is happening in the world. Do you want to? Would you like to come up? Yeah. Yeah, please. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's a, it's a real privilege and a pleasure to be here with you. Um, it's nice to see that there's some ladies in the audience too. I'd like to see that. And um, I am a filmmaker. I am a, an economist. I also work at the World Bank. So obviously it's a place where people uh, completely abandon economics and then go on to do something more interesting. And so I'm not the, I'm not the only one. I'm in good company. Um, I am not, I don't have a, a background in software. I do not have a background in Agile. So I'm here to learn. Um, this, is, this is a little bit the purpose. And I'm here to ask for help, for your help. And your help is not in money, it's in identifying good narratives that we're gonna put on a movie for a wide audiences. Because this is a very big message. It's a message that uh, says that there is a better way to work. Um, and one of the things I hear from people who, in, in your trade, is uh, that it attracts somehow people who, who uh, like to collaborate, who like to create a good atmosphere at work, who therefore their work seems to be valued and their contributions to customer value are more evident and more transparent. And that's fantastic. I mean, I have a, I'm going to have a new granddaughter uh, maybe next week. And I'm thrilled. I want to do this for her. I want to, to contribute to, to, to make this a mainstream uh, atmosphere in the workplace. This is a fantastic message. So the movie is for the general audiences. Therefore, it may not have all the detail that practitioners from Agile feel should have. So we're not going to go into the detail of why this particular Agile adoption didn't work because the boss or something. We're going to have a bird's eye view of uh, the, the concept. And uh, it's, it's, I find it very persuasive. 
um, I find that I want to know, these are the questions I want to know. I want to know what drives a company, a traditional company, a bureaucratic company, to say, we need to change. It's a big decision. It's not minor. It's a cultural decision. It's, a, it's an investment. So I want to know companies that have that narrative. I want to know, is it just IT, or has it gone beyond IT? And uh, maybe that's not a really good question, and you, you have to tell me that, not because I'm, I'm asking, because the Internet of Things is making IT a core function. It's not just something on the side anymore. So maybe that's not a really good question. Um, I'm looking for companies that are visually attractive. So maybe there's a great story in a pharma company well, if they kill somebody, maybe, you know, there's some drama there. But basically, uh, things <laughs> something like Lego is visually fantastic. But it's not the only thing. You have to have a real story. Something that they tried a transformation, it worked, it didn't work, somebody opposed it, somebody didn't like it. So, so, so it has to have all these elements. So my asking you for help is, um, my, I'm going to put my cards on that table. Um, contact me if you think you have something interesting that you feel that could be in the movie that could interest the whole world that that to would help spread the message just uh, write me an email shoot me an email text message and, and we'll get into in touch so. she's gonna make you a star <laughs> <laughs> thank you Okay, so Steve, <coughs> um, is this your first visit here in, in the Nordic countries? I, when I was at the World Bank, I used to come here all the time. I, I was designated as the World Bank representative for the Scandinavian countries, for the African region. So every uh, September, I would come and visit Copenhagen, um, <laughs> Stockholm, uh, and uh, in Finland, and uh, uh, yeah, so I, uh, Oslo, so I was, um, I would come here, and it was very interesting because we had kind of the same conversation in the four capitals each year, <laughs> and although it was the same conversation, we sort of got the different, slightly different nuances between <laughs> the four countries. So I, I sort of had a uh, a test of visiting. Uh, Scandinavia back then. So I, I, I used to love coming here. And, um, uh, but I never stayed long enough to actually see what was there. I'd be rushing in and have meetings and then rush out again. So I still have a lot to learn, but um, I enjoyed coming here. Yeah. And now that in the learning consortium, I mean, why am I here now? I mean, in addition to meeting you guys um, and girls, it's. Um, is a meeting of the learning consortium, these firms that have got together to find out what's going on in Agile. And so we're meeting with Ericsson and having a site visit to Scania on Wednesday. And um, then um, we're heading off to Copenhagen. Um, and uh, we're, uh, we have a number of workshops. One is on leadership storytelling, and, and then two others on, um, on Agile and the age of Agile. And, all of that. So, so, and we're working on the film and trying to find um, uh, attractive sites and people and things that would actually fit into a film. So you mentioned you've written a book already, which was called Radical Management right. uh, some years ago. Now you're coming up with a new book. It's called The Age of Agile. So what made you decide that this is the right title for this book and what does that title mean to you? Well, in 2010, Agile was really quite contested territory. Um, and so uh, it didn't s seem then that Agile was the right topic. So we had an argument with the publisher um, and they eventually settled on uh, the Leader's Guide to Radical Management. Um, um, and um, many people hated that title. <laughs> I mean, all of my books, in fact, they've hated the title. 
Uh, everyone has a different idea of what the title of a book should be, except this one. Um, some, we, I, we, I got this idea from a talk given in the Drucker Forum in 2016 by an um, uh, uh, English professor, and he said, look, that's, that's what's happening. We are now in the age of Agile. Bureaucracies are dead, meritocracies are dead. We are living in the age of Agile. I said, oh, that sounds interesting. And he went on to write a book called Fast Forward. And I said, well, okay. <laughs> it's not the title of your book. Well, it'll be the title of my book. And I have yet to meet anyone who doesn't like this title. So as opposed to my previous books where everyone hated <laughs> the title, I finally stumbled on a title that Everyone liked, because it does signify that this is something quite large. This is something that is not just some management gadget. It's not happening in a tiny part of organizations. This is something that is affecting everything, the way we live, the way we work, the way we understand how the world, is, um, how the world fits together. So it, it does capture that, and it's, um, from a literary point of view, it has assonance, <laughs> the age of Agile, and uh, so it's, uh, it has a lot going for it. Um, so if there is anyone who doesn't like the title, I'd like to meet them, but uh, <laughs> 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 it's, uh, it's been helpful in terms of signifying this is something quite significant that's going on in the world. So uh, <clears throat> when you did the, the research for this book mm -hmm. and uh, kind of started thinking about putting this book together, mm -hmm. what were some of the key learnings that you really decided, I need to feature these key learnings because uh, they're kind of the main message? Well, I'd, since 2010, I've written over 700 articles in um, <laughs> Forbes. Um, so it wasn't so much of... Um, what, were I, what was I going to <laughs> write about? It was more of all of this um, tremendous wordiness. Uh, uh, what were the main messages? What, it, what was the, the critical thing? And, and the scene changed um, quite a bit. I mean, the, when Harvard Business Review wrote an, uh, an article about Agile in 2016, and McKinsey had a big uh, agile hackathon, 1,500 people. That sort of sent a, a message that agile had, was was really there. So that was a signal that this this was something that you could actually talk about, and people in business would uh, start to to recognize. The uh, uh, it's also things have moved along quite a lot in terms of just the. I mean, the, the role that Apple and Amazon and Google and Facebook and Microsoft play is, I mean, in, uh, five years ago, they were not the dominant uh, firms in the stock market. They were, they were big, but they were not, certainly not the biggest. And so this whole thing has moved along quite, and part of the struggle has been to keep track of and to have something that is, is really up to date. And um, so it's more a question of selecting. And I think the, it, it starts off by saying that um, the world has changed in the sense that now everything and everyone is, can be connected with everything else and everyone else. Um, and this is something that we're only just scratching the surface of the implications of that. That means that the whole world is, is going to be reinvented. Um, and parts of it we can see, uh, but it's, it's going to be much larger. And it, what it means in the, uh, in the business world is that once that becomes possible, it starts to become necessary. And the business success, which used to be about doing something which was pretty much okay, and you could sell it, and that was okay, uh, now firms need to be, if they want to flourish, uh, be having instant, intimate, frictionless, um, incremental value at scale. Instant, in intimate, frictionless, incremental value at scale. This, in other words, 
you need to be able to, people want to find things immediately. They don't want to have to uh, wait around. People have become very urgent. They want something that's personalized to them. Um, they want something that is, um, is, is getting better. And in fact, they want it cheaper. They want it better and cheaper. And if you're in, a, if you're in business, that is the performance that you need to be aiming at. And, and most big firms are not delivering that and um, don't have the capability to deliver that. And so their future is uh, somewhat gloomy if, unless they change. Um, at the same time, in the agile world, um, there is a, a harsh lesson that the book has uh, that the assumption, I think, of the founders of the movement, the Agile Manifesto, assumed that if we wrote better software, uh, we would make better products, and we would be duly rewarded in the marketplace, uh, we would get financial returns. But what I just described to you in terms of the this new marketplace in which the customers are in charge of the marketplace and want better products at lower prices and have op options to go elsewhere if you don't deliver that. It means that that whole assumption that if we do better work, we will be rewarded for it uh, is not materializing. And there are so many, many firms that have discovered that to their grief that Simply doing better work, making better software, um, is is not by itself the secret of success, and that one needs to be finding new markets, uh, new customers, um, what I've called strategic agility, market creating innovations that uh, you enter a new field where there is no competition in which people are willing to actually give you some. Uh, value back in terms of, for all the effort you put into your products and services. So that is a whole uh, set of lessons and, and discoveries for the agile world. So I think we're all we're all learning, and um, there's there's no room for complacency. Um, simply being agile is 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 not the answer. That's part of the story, but it's that's uh, it's only part. So, how can then um, traditional companies now that are lagging behind, how can they take back um, their place in, in the market? Is it at all possible for them to, to change? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, they should read my book. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most important thing do you think that they can do now, uh, except for reading your book? No, <laughs> no they. Um, um, well, you see, I mean, as I said, 94% want to be agile. So it's not like I have to persuade them that to, to want to be agile. They want it's to be agile. So the, uh, the problem is the how? It's the, it's the gap between the 94% the who want to be agile and the 6% who, who are agile. That's just 88% <laughs> uh, we have to work on. And um, we were talking on the way over here as to whether there are some people that it, it's just impossible for them to, to learn, that only, only death or retirement will solve the problem. Um, I really don't think that's the general case. I think that um, uh, certainly people are entrenched in their habits and their attitudes and their goals and their values, but, but they can learn. And the, uh, the, the marketplace is a harsh teacher, and uh, most Firms, I mean, the reason why the 94% want to be agile is they can see they have problems. So it's not like I have to point out that there are problems. Um, what <coughs> happens though when they look and see um, what would be involved in doing this, it's so different. It, it's kind of like visiting a foreign country where the customs are all different, where no means yes and a smile means anger, and uh, you, you can't make sense of this world. Um, where letting go of control uh, increases control. Focusing, not focusing on making our money ends up making money. All of these very strange kinds of uh, customs which are 
in this new foreign country is, is just difficult. And some people, uh, some managers just grab it and say, wow, let's do it. Let's, let's start tonight. And um, I meet people, they went, run home to their spouse and say, I had this most amazing thing, <laughs> amazing. Thing. We're going to change everything in this organization. And the, the spouse is sitting there, wow. <laughs> and then it, it says, well, I, we're going to start in our family. We're going, to have, we're going to have scrum in our family, and we're going to have a scrum tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> put some of those people in the film. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but can they change fast enough? Uh, or will they die? Well, they're obviously, there are going to be some casualties. Um, <laughs> and um, and there, um, there's, it's, it's partly intellectual learning, but it's partly also that they have a different muscle memory. And, and you just can't change something. I give the example of the, um, the backward bicycle. Have you ever heard of the backward bicycle? No, I mean, it's those who haven't. It, it's a bicycle that when you turn the handlebars right, the bicycle goes left. And so you know intellectually, <laughs> you want to go left, you turn the thing right. Uh, but um, when you actually sit, get on this thing, uh, you simply can't do it. You cannot make the adjustment in your muscles to do what you know you have to do intellectually. And um, so uh, there's a very funny video on it, so you can watch that. But um, and the guy who who sort of discovered this, he actually uh, spent nine months trying to learn to ride <laughs> the backward bicycle. And at the end of nine months, he w one day he woke up and suddenly he could do it. Suddenly, it, he clicked and he could ride the backward bicycle. The only problem was now he couldn't ride a regular bicycle. <laughs> so. But so. that presupposes that. Um, oh, I lost it. Sorry. <laughs> it presupposes you want it, you, you know what to do, and you want to do it. Yeah. Um, it and there it, are. It, it presupposes yeah. that you're motivated to do it. I wanted mm. to say that you want mm. to do it. And how mm. do you make? What's the carrot for these managers who are losing everything when when mm. the company becomes agile? Well, they. They're not losing everything in the short run. I mean, they're still getting their bonuses. They're still getting paid. They're still, and the retirement's not so far away. And if they just hang on, um, they, they may may be able to make it. So it's not like there are no incentives. And when everyone around you is acting in the old way, I mean, there are tremendous um, pressures to keep acting in, in the old way. But I say it's, um, <coughs> you see, many cases where um, uh, people who you think, well, he or she will never change, but I go there and, wow, <laughs> they, they have changed. I mean, one, one person I know <coughs> was um, actually uh, knew intellectually that he needed to do it, but like the backward bicycle, he just couldn't seem to get the hang of it. And um, he... Um, uh, had a coach, maybe one of you guys even, <laughs> and uh, uh, was um, uh, do something or ask the coach. Suppose suppose I did this, and the coach would say, "Well, you could do that, but that would make it really bad." And so he'd go away and think some more, and then uh, suppose I did that, and the coach would say, "That would make it even worse." <laughs> He couldn't really get the hang. He knew what he had to do, but couldn't get the hang because in this mode of giving instructions and uh, just couldn't get the hang of it. But then he went on vacation with a whole pile of books and um, spent his time reading the books. And then he wrote to the coach and said, well, suppose I did A, B, C, and D. The coach said, right, now you've got it. Now you don't need me anymore. Now you've got the hang of it. So the penny sort of finally dropped like that. The, back, the backward bicycle. So there are cases like that. There are obviously cases where it's it's a long slog and reversions and um, and the, this is uh, this is it's difficult to change behavior. And um, um, I mean, one of the most celebrated um, implementations is at Menlo Innovations with Richard Sheridan. Um, uh, but he admits that 
quite often he slides back into non-agile <laughs> behaviors. And so it's, it's not like um, someone who's known that, who's dedicated his whole life to doing that, uh, every now and then he slides into different ways of doing things. So this is difficult even with the strongest possible motivation. So if it's about behaviors, then I guess that uh, HR will be mo more important in the future and uh, their role. And you recently wrote a, a couple of articles around Agile HR. Uh, Do you like to comment on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I'd say it's, it's more than behavior. I mean, I sometimes give a three-word talk, <laughs> Agile is mindset. <laughs> That's my talk, <laughs> now, I'll, now I'll answer questions. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's it fundamentally about mindset. The behaviors flow from from the mindset, and the it's the mindset has uh, the book suggests three main elements. So what I've called they're so important I've called them laws. And one is the total folk obsession with delivering value to customers and end users. The second, uh, descaling big problems so that they can be handled by small. Uh, cross-functional self-organizing teams, getting feedback from customers, and then thirdly, that the whole organization functions as a network, um, not a top-down bureaucracy. Those are the three most important elements that I see in, the, in this mindset, but it's a mindset that leads to behaviors. Now, the, uh, I, th I think the, the firms in the learning consortium probably didn't pay much attention to HR um, when they were doing their agile journey, I would say for a number of years, they they thought, well, those people are irrelevant. They're just they they don't understand this. They will never understand it. They won't be helpful, and uh, we'll just ignore them. Uh, but over time, they saw that these back office functions, HR and budgeting, caused a lot more problems than they had expected, and so there is now quite a bit of effort going on to say, well, what would agile management of people look like? Uh, and how could we make it something that's adding to agile instead of sort of trying to minimize the damage that they do? And uh, because the, in most of the, the firms, the, um, <laughs> the um, ad, HR practices are <coughs> very non-agile, very bureaucratic, uh, very doing everything the opposite of what you are trying to do in agile. Even the name, human resources, this is like calling um, the finance department the, the fraud department because you're, call, you're calling the thing the very opposite of what you're trying to accomplish. You're, tr you're, te you're treating people as things, resources that are going to be mined by the corporation and then thrown away after you've mined all the good in them. I mean, the very name uh, is back to front. Um, and all of the practices grew up in the bureaucracies where the HR was acting basically as the, uh, the executioner on behalf of the top management. You need to fire 3,000 people? Right, we'll do it. Um, you want to um, cut salaries? Right, we'll do it. Uh, you want to, whatever you need to do, HR will be the uh, I'll do the dirty work in the organization and uh, uh, often put, acting as, as though they were the friend of the staff, but um, uh, off, the, there was a lot of fear and loathing in relation to HR uh, departments. So against that background, um, kind of nowhere to go but up, right? <laughs> uh, can't get any worse than that. Um, and what you see in the, um, the last article I wrote about Vistaprint, that um, really they've taken the whole sort of child mindset to heart and really rethinking, I mean, what would it take to make the, the people management really a, a part of this? And Vistaprint is a, it has about 5,000 people, so it's not a huge company, but it's, it's growing quite rapidly. And uh, because it, it, it doesn't have a name like Google or Apple, they have difficulty recruiting the very best talent. And so 
the, the challenge in the, in the people management is to create an experience at Vistaprint, which will, first of all, uh, attract. Uh, people will want to have that experience, an experience that delivers value to the customer and that um, is aligned with the kind of experience they're trying to create in the customer. So the people management, they call themselves the talent and experience team. And they're seeing the experience of being in this organization is their product. And uh, it's not a, a project that they're implementing and it has to be done by a deadline and then it's finished and then what's the next project. This is a continuing <coughs> goal to make the experience of working in, in Vistaprint something that you will to remember for the rest of your life. This will be a peak experience and people will want to come to Vistaprint to live that experience. That's the kind of thinking that they have got going. Um, it's a work in process. They, there's still many things they have to work on, but it has meant that those people are embedded in the business. They're in, uh, working together with the agile coaches and they, have, they are part of the business. Uh, they're not some function of, on the side that's causing problems. They are a, acting on a daily basis to solve problems. And most importantly, I think they are turning the, uh, saying that sort of performance evaluation is the responsibility of the individual. It's not the organization evaluating the staff member. This is the staff member themselves seeking out uh, how they can improve, how they can, become, how they can contribute more value to customers. And instilling that throughout the whole organization um, is, is a huge challenge. And, and the HR, formerly HR, now talent and experience, that's what they're busy doing, trying to rethink everything in, in the organization so that that's the way people think, that I'm not here to be evaluated, I'm here to improve myself, I'm here to get help on how to deliver more value to customers and have an amazing time. And, uh, and when, I, when I leave Vistaprint, I will then go around the world and go to Stockholm and tell people what a wonderful <laughs> place uh, it is to work in Vistaprint. Um, so that's, that is a case of a fund that I think is quite far along in terms of really taking seriously agile principles and reimagining what people management could be like, should be like, and is in fact becoming a reality. That's a long answer. Yeah, it's, it was a good one. Uh, Vistaprint will be coming to the Agile People Conference in fall. So you get a chance to hear more then. Uh, I have one more question before we're going to open up to some questions from everybody else here. And uh, I've had the chance to, you mentioned, what was it, 700 plus articles? Uh -huh. Oh my God, that's, that's a lot of production. I've had a ch the opportunity to read a few of those over the years. I must say it's been quite enjoyable. Um, you write with an edge and, and sometimes a little bit more than just the provocateur. So I just want to ask you about uh, that writing style. Is that just your personality or is just that something that's been developing over time? Um, I don't know, you can ask my friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I was always trying to um, get the right balance. I mean, if I write something that really offends people, um, and then how, help, how helpful is that? How constructive is that? Um, so I'm, I try to have a, a sense of humor with the edge. And um, I try to look at these um, uh, challenges um, sort of constructively. I mean, right now, for instance, I mean, McKinsey has produced this book uh, which sort of endorses Agile but has a lot of silly things in it, <laughs> really stupid things and uh, and so what do I do I mean, I could write a slashing article pointing out every stupid thing in the book um, or I could um, uh, ignore all the stupid things in the book um, and point to the the fact that they do at least endorse agile as, as something that has potential in the world and they cite a couple of companies that are I think doing it extremely well, Facebook and Hair, 
a Chinese firm, um, <laughs> or I could have a, a blend of the two, that I would salute the positive things, uh, but also point to some of the, the um, uh, things that could have been stated more <laughs> effectively, let's say. <laughs> so I'm always struggling as to, uh, I mean, to get into a big fight with McKinsey probably isn't such a good idea. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, someone needs to say, look, this was wrong. <laughs> to say that you implement Agile in a top-down fashion, telling people what to do, uh, that, is, that is not Agile, and someone needs to say that. But to say it in a way that uh, McKinsey doesn't get so totally offended that they, we get into a stupid fight. Yeah, I can imagine there's a difference between poking the bear and just maybe tickling it and <laughs> getting a laugh out of it. So with that, we're going to open up for some questions. So who's going to have the first question? So please be loud, yeah. and I'll repeat the question. So the question, so the question is: Did you have an imaginary reader and a target audience to be able to select from all these potential viewpoints and messages? The primary audience are two million managers. Um, the agile audience, I hope that they will also <laughs> like it, um, and I hope they'll be helpful to them. But they can use it to uh, persuade these reluctant. Uh, difficult managers who need to get on the same page. And so it's, uh, I see it as a tool that they can use to, um, uh, to help move this agenda along. And so it's, but it's basically aimed at trying to speak to managers and, and say, look, this, this is the future. This is the way organizations are going to be. Um, you can either <laughs> get with it. <laughs> Um, and flourish, or you can fight it and be crushed. Uh, those are the long-term choices, um, and here's why. And there are very solid economic, financial, social reasons why this is so. And um, so why don't you join, join the parade? And um, I'm always uneasy when I uh, sort of get it in front of people like you who, who know so much more about it than I do. <laughs> Um, and um, and uh, I was at the, in Boston with uh, Agile New England, and so there were people like Jeff Sutherland and in the audience of the, the um, one of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto. So I'm always nervous that um, he might leap up and say, "That's not what the Agile Manifesto said. You are, <laughs> you are, you are challenging and putting in question some of our sacred." beliefs. You changed the language of the Agile Manifesto, but that, that didn't happen. And uh, he was, he's very, been very helpful. And in fact, um, uh, almost all of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto have been helpful and, and supportive and, uh, and, uh, and, and happy to see the thing move along, that they're not sort of locked in the past. But, uh, but there's always a danger that someone will rise up and say, this isn't Agile. <laughs> I have to fight. Yeah. I have a st ex question for you, Steve, that was, it was in this area. You said you had your own experience about storytelling, and that's how you got into this. Uh -huh. And I was curious to hear, what's your own experience about Agile in your own organizations or what you have done yourself, not just uh, looking at what others are doing and evaluating, but actually doing yourself? Well, I, I mean, I've learned an enormous amount from uh, being with these companies in the learning consortium. And so I found uh, many of, much of what's in the book has come out of those, those experiences, those stories, those narratives. And um, one of the, uh, the stories which le actually leads off the book uh, is from Spotify, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which um, I think is, is I, at least so far, the best single story about what Agile is, and this was the, the Discover Weekly uh, that uh, is probably not better than I do. In 2015, Spotify had done very well, had 60 million users, but they 
growth was slowing and there was a problem. Um, people were spending most of their time searching these 20 million songs to try to find music they would like rather than actually listening to music. And this was something that was really beginning to s slow the growth of Spotify. And unless they could do something about it, their future would be quite bleak uh, because they had these big competitors, Amazon, Apple, Google, <laughs> starting to come on the scene al along with Pandora. And all of these firms had this problem. Um, so they all knew it was a problem. And the management of um, uh, Spotify knew it was a problem. And they had the hypothesis that the solution lay in having better search. That if you had a better search function, this would enable people to find the music they loved. And they had around 100 people working on this. Um, but a, a couple of um, people um, at a hackathon said, no, there's a better idea. Why don't we take the classification of the 20 million songs that we have, take all the not information we have about what music each individual user loves, and every week give them a playlist which would be the 30 songs which we think they will love the most. And the, um, uh, the management of Spotify didn't like this idea. They thought it's never going to work. Uh, it, it, it's simply too complex a task. And Apple has already got into a lot of problems by inserting music in the iPhone that U2 <laughs> music that people didn't want, so this is going to be, uh, cause all sorts of backlash. So this is not a good idea. Uh, so in a, in a traditional organization, that would be the end of it. That would be the end of the discussion. And you never hear more about this idea. But in this case, uh, in Spotify, as you know, they, there's a lot of latitude for teams to keep exploring ideas that are focused on delivering value for customers. And so they went ahead and worked on it. And within a, a month or so, had actually put together a, a prototype which they simply inserted in the playlist of the uh, Spotify staff. There was no announcement. There was no uh, big declaration, no public uh, relations about it. They simply inserted it. In the, in, 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 in certain, and then people in Spotify suddenly started finding, what's this playlist, Discover Weekly? And, Wow, it's amazing what's in there. And so there was this whole buzz within uh, Spotify. Yeah, I mean, what is this? What is? Who did this? How did this happen? And um, so that then led to proposal, well, why don't we do an experiment on 1% of Spotify users? And bingo, it was a huge hit with them. And so four months later, they did this to all the 60 million uh, users uh, of um, Spotify. And it was a huge hit. 21 uh, languages, 15 time zones, uh, all around the world. People are waiting nine <laughs> Monday mornings to get their new Discover Weekly. And this had this huge increase in users. People <coughs> loved this. I mean, the reason I found out about Spotify, my daughter told me, Dad, you've got to get this. You've got to get Discover Weekly. Mm -hmm. So it was that kind of thing that happened all around the world. So that is how they've got to... 150 million users. That's how they got to have a successful launch on the Wall Street uh, two weeks ago, worth around $30 billion. Um, that wouldn't have happened if they hadn't been able to take this Discover Weekly. So that's an illustration of Agile in action having huge financial gains uh, with an idea that totally transformed the relationship of users to Spotify. So that's an example of story. That's the best story I have about Agile. If you, if you have a better story uh, about Agile, I'd love to hear about it. So um, what advice would you like to give an organization of this one of these 88% that are still left there? Or maybe to a coach or a consultant who is working with transformation? So um, from, from my experience, mm. the way we are implementing something is often more important important than what we are implementing. Right. Right. So, are, you know, have you seen examples of non-agile implementation of agile, or you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, what advice would I give them? Well, I'd tell them, go and 
Go and talk to Crisp. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, um, um, uh, there are obviously lots and lots of very bad implementations of Agile. And um, I think it's quite important to uh, identify that and call it out and say that is not Agile, that is bad stuff. And uh, I've done, that's part of the edginess of my articles, trying to say, look, that's, that's not right. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of stuff in this McKinsey book that is exactly like that. You implement Agile by driving it from the top and telling people what they have to do and what behaviors they're now expected of them. Um, that doesn't work, in my experience. Um, those are f and end up in quickly failed implementations. Uh, the only success that I've seen is really where it happens organically within the firm. And that uh, the, you have people, um, not just at the top, uh, but typically in the, the middle or upper middle part of the organization who've seen the future and are convinced uh, this is the future and become champions. And, um, and uh, initially when they do it, they are, uh, uh, they are pariahs, they are, they are lepers, they are <laughs> doing things the wrong way. And often they have to do it in the dark of night. Um, and um, undercover, uh, but in due course, they, uh, in the successful cases, the, the uh, higher up begins to hear about it and is willing to support it. And in the successful cases, <coughs> that's what happened. I mean, Microsoft, which I've written about quite a lot, um, that's what happened. I mean, in 2008, there was um, one guy in the bowels of the, um, of the visual studio saying this is never going to work. He, they brought a product to the market and found that someone else was there way before them. Um, they said we have to do things differently. And um, so, it, so it's one team in 2008, another three teams he persuaded to do it in 2009. 2010, the whole of visual studio, which was 25 teams, um, <laughs> 2011, uh, corporate vice president said the whole, the whole of the developer division, um, we're going to go agile. And then, uh, in due course, I mean, Satya Nadella was happened to be the head of the developer division, and so he, 2015, became the the CEO of Microsoft. So there was this. Um, sort of organic movement within Michael. Uh, they had a lot of coaches to start with, but it, they owned it. And all of the examples in the learning consortium are where a, <coughs> a process has been uh, ignited or stimulated by, by coaches and whatnot, but the, the, the continuing impetus comes from people, champions within the firm, who believe this is the way of the future. And, will fight to the death to, to make it happen. And, um, but it's, it's organic within the firm. So finding the champions, finding actual champions, finding the potential champions, I see is, is critical to, to making this happen. So at the beginning of this talk, you talked a bit about this idea that was going to change the world by 2020. Yeah. It sounded like you had a really clear idea idea of what that idea was. Can you talk a bit more about that? Well, it was what I wrote about in the book, of radical management. I said, the, here are uh, the seven, these seven principles. I think by 2020, these seven principles will be, um, will be dominant. And um, uh, of course, what I found was that seven was too many. Um, I immediately had to reduce it to five in my presentations, and then Last year, I got it down to three, <laughs> three laws, and now it's three words of agile is mindset. Um, so I had to simplify the, the message uh, quite a lot. And, um, but uh, I mean, obviously, with only 6% of firms highly agile, we've still got a lot, long way to go. But when the biggest firms in the world 
and the fastest growing firms in the world are implementing these principles. I mean, it's only a matter of time before this thing uh, spreads much more rapidly. And what is the anti-democracy? That means something more to it. Sorry? Uh, the anti say that they should be more agile. What do you mean by that? Throwing out line for a line? Well, what is that agile was the question. Uh, I mean, I, my definition as the, and this, basically it's a mindset that embodies these three principles or laws. That's what I mean by, by agile. And so if you have, uh, it's been useful, I think, it's just as a way of looking at organizations to start to say, well, is, is this firm agile? And you might say, well, um, yes, they have a lot of teams that are uh, doing pretty well, um, so that's that's good. But it's a firm that is still focused on maximizing shareholder value, as reflected in the current stock price. So that is direct opposite of agile objective. So this firm is not fully agile in that respect. Or uh, I was at a firm last week. They they have that down, they have the goal down, they have the small teams thing down, but the network thing, they don't. They, they're still struggling with trying to turn this hierarchy, pyramidal, top-down hierarchy into something where think information can flow easily sideways, upwards, downwards. Um, so it's, it's, it's obviously a, a tremendous simplification, even oversimplification of a very complex subject, but I think it's been helpful uh, to me and to others to have to sort of arrive, converge on those, uh, that, that kind of summary of the principles, because then you can start to have a, a discussion, what is fake agile and what is, what is not. What would you say is the main reason why one should even bother about uh, bother about the companies that tries to be agile and don't understand it, and instead just let them die their own slow death? <laughs> An ugly, brutal, agonizing death. <laughs> yeah, that would be so satisfying. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's some companies I would love to have that happen to them. Um, and it, but it's happening to them anyway. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering, so um, the, question, the question is serious. Why, why should I even bother? And instead, why not focus right. on supporting right. businesses and companies that actually do have some level of understanding? Or mm. even, right. why don't focus my energy on creating my own business with people that uh, share both the values and yeah. or knows how to implement those values yeah. in practice. Yeah. I uh, think there are huge social costs in, in letting uh, these organizations letting these organizations die. Um, in, s in some of these organizations uh, which are dying like GE and IBM, I mean there are wonderful, wonderful people and they are they're, Amazing expertise in these these big old firms. Um, so, and you could say, well, those those people will end up somewhere else. Well, maybe. <laughs> um, but my take is that there are huge social costs in letting those big old firms uh, or encouraging them to die, rather than saying, let's why don't we um, try to help them um, see the future and. Um, Obviously, there are people in GE and IBM who very clearly uh, see the future mm -hmm. and are desperately trying to accomplish it and trying to prevent these dinosaurs from dying. But um, they've been running into some serious roadblocks. And um, so it's touch and go whether those firms are going to survive, I would say. Um, but I, there will be huge costs if IBM disappears or GE disappears off the planet. I mean. There'll be huge costs, which are really unnecessary costs. When we, at this point, we know what to do. <laughs> it's not a matter of not knowing. It's it's, uh, it's something that can be avoided. I just slip in a comment. 
you know, the, the saying goes, survival is not mandatory, has been said before, no, right? Absolutely. And we're living in a world that's, uh, for example, software programmer is the most common profession in Stockholm mm -hmm. and has been for something like eight years. And people say software is eating the world. Mm -hmm. There's these grandiose statements. It could be a very good thing. It could be a bad thing. We also have the case that the number of people involved with tech today mm -hmm. is very high compared to 10 or 15 years ago. So if you want to find somebody that's highly experienced and had a high level of mastery, um, when they got into the business, it was quite small. So there's not that many of them. There's a big learning curve here. And there's a huge challenge to kind of, uh, there's pressure to learn how to do this. So how do we bridge that gap, uh, given what you just said? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the, the differential between the beginner and the and the advanced performer is so huge. I mean, there is there's a tremendous battle for talent, and um, uh, I don't know what it's like here in in Sokum, but in um, everyone I talk to, if I find someone who's been involved in some interesting development in some firm, and I try to contact them, where are they? They're not here anymore. They've gone to Amazon. <laughs> Uh, and they're, they're, those big firms, Google and whatnot, are just sucking up in, in America, just sucking up all the talent. And uh, so there's, there's certainly a need to, to learn faster. Um, uh, I don't have any magic answers as to, um, as to how, to, how to make that happen. Maybe it, a lot of it's experience would be my, my guess is that, um, that there are some people who will be nat naturally gifted, but uh, for most people, it's a matter of learning by doing, and that's not going to happen overnight. But um, any way we could accelerate the learning, you know, that's, that's going to be crucial. Yeah, so going back a little bit to, to the financial side of things, you started today with, with uh, telling a story about how you started in the World Bank with yeah. the target of uh, ending world poverty, yeah. right? And um, now we're working in, in India, age of Adya, where good values and good principles are actually the side effect of that are that we are ac uh, helping the companies to accumulate even more financial resources mm -hmm. um, under a uh, few umbrellas, right? Mm -hmm. um, beyond the age of Agile, do you mm -hmm. see extended value for, for the, the end user, for the customer? Um, we are struggling with quality of products. We are struggling with the effect of our products on the world and on the, on the environment and so on. Do you see this in, in, have you been spending time with those kind of thoughts? Uh, well, I have this article which um, was first published in Forbes, it was mm -hmm. published today in, um, in LinkedIn, um, addressing this rather cryptically, but nevertheless addressing it, and saying that firms need to be considering not only are they delivering value for customers, are they creating exciting workspaces, but mm -hmm. What are the so the social impacts of what they're doing? It's not the only thing they should be thinking about, but they should certainly be thinking. So, Facebook um, yeah. um, wasn't thinking about that and <laughs> has now gone through some tough times, uh, and I think will face some increasingly tough times because it didn't pay attention to the social impacts of what they're doing. And Google um, has been crushing competition by just buying firms up um, and so these these firms will if they don't um, deal with that uh, there will be consequences and um, they will be serious consequences even if it doesn't look on the surface um, I mean I think uh, Zuckerberg never wants to spend a week like he spent last week ever again in his life <laughs> and so and so what will happen is that um, there will be lawyers in, in Facebook uh, attending meetings. You can't say that. No, <laughs> you can't do this. You can't do that. And this, of course, is what slowed Microsoft down, that these hearings, even if they don't lead to legislative action, um, wake the companies up. And they can, they can really stifle innovation. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, in a sense, what created Google. I mean, if, if uh, Microsoft hadn't been slowed down, maybe Google wouldn't have ever existed and would have been Microsoft doing it. So, so the firms have to pay attention to the, the social costs 
uh, implications of what they're doing. And if they don't, there will be grievous consequences and, uh, uh, for doing so. So I, and uh, I mean, I, I think the privacy law in, in, in Europe will really slow down getting Facebook in a major, major way. I was thinking maybe we should take a small break uh, and let you rest a bit, have something to eat maybe. Okay. And we may continue afterwards with more informal discussions. Um, we'll think of something to do in the <laughs> meantime. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure.